computational science, environmental science, management science, etc. And thus providing a profound impact on our daily lives. There are many examples where we have been using this nanotechnology. For example, so I am giving only two or three. So now, for example, first of all, billions of microscopic nano whiskers, is, uh, each about 10 nanometers in length, have been molecularly hooked onto material and synthetic fibers to impact stain resistance to clothing and other fabrics. Secondly, zinc oxide nanocrystals have been used to create invisible sunscreen that block ultraviolet light. Third, silver nanocrystals have been embedded in bandages to kill bacteria and prevent infection, and so on and so forth. There are plenty of examples where people are using nowadays the nanotechnology. I hope this kind of workshop will give the avenues for our research scholars and scientists to learn many things from our resource persons uh, who is giving their uh, speech here. Uh, Dr. Besboro and, and Dr. Das. So I would like to thank the Department of Chemistry and Zoology of our college and the Zoological Society of Assam for organizing this kind of workshop, who will uh, definitely boost up the morals of our research scholars and teachers and students to uh, choose the nanotechnology as one of their field of research in the days to come. I welcome you all once again to this virtual platform. And thank you very much. Over to you, Sankranti. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, sir, for your beautiful words. Now we have amongst us two eminent personalities and also the pride of Assam, who is with us for gracing today's occasion. So, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, one of the eminent personality, that is Dr. Achinta Bejborwa, sir. Dr. Achinta Bishburwa is an Associate Professor of Civil Environmental Engineering in North Dakota State University of USA. He completed his Bachelor's in Engineering, that is Civil Engineering, from Assam Engineering College in 1987. He further completed his MSc degree in Environmental Science and Engineering from Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay, in 1992. He successfully completed his PhD in 2002 in civil engineering from University of Nebraska, Lincoln. He has been granted with a number of scholarships and awards like Fulbright Scholarship in Environmental Engineering and, Nanot and Nanotechnology in 2018, NDSU College of Engineering, a teacher of the award in 2017, NDSU Apple Polisher Award 2015 for making an exceptional impact on students' college experience, NDSU College of Engineering Researcher of the Year Award 2014, and a lot more. He rendered service as a graduate teacher assistant in the University of Nebraska Lincoln from 1999 to 2002. He also worked as an assistant professor from 1997 to 1999 and as a lecturer in 1988 to 1997 of civil engineering in Assam Engineering College. He has shown prominent leadership qualities in various spheres, like being the National Secretary of Sustainable Nanotechnology Organization of Washington, D.C. from 2017 to, to present, and again the Associate Editor of ASCE Journal of Environmental Engineering, American Society of Civil Engineers from 2017 to present, and a lot more. His publications include numerous research papers published in high impact factor journals of both national and international. He also depicted his ability by presenting papers and attending many national and international symposia and conferences in various programs. At North Dakota State University, his research group extensively works on environment nanotechnology for groundwater remediation and life cycle studies on nanomaterials. He has published research funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, North Dakota Department of Commerce, National Science Foundation, U.S. Geological Survey, North Dakota Water Commission, and the North Dakota Water Research, research Institute, among others. He is the director of NDSU Engineering Grand Challenges College Program. Being an active member of the Sustainable Nanotechnology Organization since its inception, Sir has instrumentally providing young professional activities like the nano pitch. 
He is currently working on the nanotechnology research and application promotion in North Dakota and his native state of Assam in the Northeast India. We are lucky to have you amongst us, sir. Now, I would like to request sir to kindly continue with his presentation. Over to you, sir. Okay, before security, that I think Tanoi is trying to get in there. I think he is not getting okay. access for some reason. So okay, I just I send him. Look into it, sir. Yes, sure. Okay, he's. I, I'll tell him to try to get get in again. Anyway, so anyway, well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, good morning as well. You know, so those who are joining from good US, evening, I know a few of them are you're joining from US. Uh, so what I'll do, I'll just start sharing the screen. Our idea is to just briefly introduce, even though I say we will nanotechnology, we will not introduce nanotechnology at all. We will briefly introduce nanotechnology and talk about some of the stuff we do. And then what we'll do is we'll go into Tonoi. Uh, we'll show you the lab setup and everything that you need to have uh, for carrying out nanotechnology research. So that, that's what we'll, we'll try to you know, so uh, I think no, no, Tono is still getting a screen that you know access is denied. So if you can look into that one, that will be great. Okay. Now let me share the screen. Okay. Give me a minute here. Can you see the can you see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. We have seen good. good. Again, thank you very much for inviting me. I think it is almost 30 years possibly I visited Pragjadis College. I, I visited Pragjadis College uh, as an uh, assistant professor in Assam Engineering College when I was working in Dipperville. So I think we had a discussion and I suppose then I followed it up. I think I visited twice. This is my third visit to your university, though virtually. You know, uh, you know it, it is always good to see the enthusiastic group in Prejudice College because Prejudice College, I know you're pioneer in, you're pioneering in a lot of stuff, which is very good. So when the, Dr. Kolita talked to me, I thought we'll just go beyond conventional popular discussion about nanotechnology will go beyond that. So today the impact an exciting day, as you know, that you know, Blue Origin just came back and went to space and came back. Today is an exciting day. I just saw the launch and sort of coming back. So such an exciting day. I think it is time that, you know, we also uh, in Assam and everywhere we you know get into exciting technology. Nanotechnology is one of the areas which is very exciting. I know a lot of you are already working on that. Uh, but we'd like to see whether we can work on something common. We can work things together. Uh, so let's first go through quickly about what is nanotechnology, what nanotechnology is. The scale itself, you know, a human being is about 2 million nanometer tall. So if you then come uh, to DNA, DNA is only about two nanometer, you know, uh, uh, size. So that gives you the perspective. So typically, we are very familiar with the microparticles. We know microorganisms, and we know the Let microscope. See whether we to, can look into uh, or microorganisms. Common. We can the nano is smaller than that. These are the fundamental so, break, you know, building let's first go so this is about another scale technology. What nano so technology is. is. Uh, so the human hair itself, is about, you know, you know, a human being is about 80,000 nanometer, nanometer tall. Uh, so if you then come tall? to DNA, so DNA is only about uh, two nanometer. Then, you know, uh, as you can see, that's hydrogen atom is point. So that one gives you the perspective. So our idea so is we are very familiar than starting from big, no microorganisms. You know, 
And we know uh, the microscope, for example, again, looking at the orbital and from a big piece of the moon is smaller. Yeah. Yeah. These yeah. are the fundamental building parts. So, we can build another scale and the scale and build up the waves. So, the human hair is the best. That's the beauty of nanometer. And a human being, you can basically make it a human being. You can basically make it a human being. You can make it a nanometer tall. Of course, there are some things you then are not built, but it's all theoretically to DNA. So, DNA, so your fingernail grows nanometer, then you know, nanometer every second, as you can see. That so this is the exciting thing. So, so that one means you have to so what is the idea? You see, we are going to use radiation starting from big you know, micro micro you know, and we have uh, a microscope for example, looking at the stars and orbiting the universe from a big piece of the moon. This is the fundamental building. 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 So the human hair is the best. That's the beauty of RNA. A human being can be made of eight thousand nanometer and nanometer tall. Of course, there are some things you then cannot be able to do. That is related to DNA. So DNA. So your fingernail grows then in nanometer every second. As you can see, so this is the exciting thing. So so that means you have to start with the idea. You see, we are going to use radiation starting from big to look at the horizon or to leave. And we have a microscope for example, looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. ideas so we are going to use radiation starting from the moon to the horizon or to leave. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And we have a microscope for looking at the stars and orbiting the universe. And this is the DNA. Nothing to do with so your fingernail goes down in nanometer every second. As you can and see, so, so this is the idea. 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 So if you look at the calculations, you know you will see that surface area has increased. You get more surface area. It is like you know you have you using spices. So take for example, you use the you know in Assamese we call it potaguti. So you use pota or a grinder to grind the spices, right? You don't use solid spice. Solid spice is not going to meet the curry. Or mutton or whatever you are making tasty. So if you only if you put powdered one or paste, then only it will be tastier. That is the essence. That is the basic fundamental principles of nanotechnology. So you have more surface area, more interaction, so it will be more effective. So now, if I cut into nano size now, each cube is one nanometer. So then what you are going to see. You are going to see. This is these are in centimeters, as you can see. These are in centimeters. So ten to the power nine is one nanometer. 
So these are centimeters. So you will actually get so much high surface area. So this is the essence. So you need to have as small particle as possible. That's why, you know, anything can be expressed in nanometer, but if it is less than 100 nanometer, in, at least in one dimension, then only we identify that as a nanomaterial. You know, you can have a 500 nanometer by 600 nanometer by one 200 nanometer particle, but that's not a nanomaterial. So nanomaterial has to be less than 100 nanometer, at least in one direction. So now, so there are so many things being developed. So I'm just bringing up a few things which are relevant to, you know, Assam and that part of India. So take, for example, there are people being used polymeric spheres for improved oil recovery. So these are being used already. So there are, uh, you can recover it to a spill or something, spill of oil, you can recover it very quickly using this nanomaterial. Now also, this is another interesting thing uh, one of our friends in uh, Harvard has developed. So this is simple water. So simple water being made into nano size. So these are nano size particles. So this nano size particle, what it's going to do is going to actually revolutionize the washroom concept. So as you go wash your hands, you're no longer going to use a lot of water. You're just going to put your hand below this, you know, emulsifier or whatever you call it. So these are nano size water particles. So you use a little bit of it, they're charged, so your hand is clean. So, uh, so this is, in fact, people are talking about it will be commercialized and you'll see, start seeing them very soon. So this is how it works, it is searched. So there are some pretty simple instrumentation are needed. So this is actually being commercialized already. So there are also other, you know, this is not only the only work that is being reported, also there are other people who have done similar work. So, so they have done that. So you can actually, you know, control order very easily rather than using this regular household uh, air freshener. You can use more benign air fresheners are not necessarily good. You know, they contain chemicals, but you can use benign water to uh, remove order. So now these are the different production methods they use. So you can actually use a thermal decomposition, solvotherbin method, precipitation method, electrochemical method, or you can just ball mill. You can just grind it way we create our spices. You can just grind it to create nanomaterial. So we'll be talking about one of the precipitation methods here. So let's go into nanoparticles in specific. So let's look into some of the things, you know, applications. You know, before, because I, I'm introducing this because Tonoi will be showing you some of the safety measures. Oh, by the way, Tonoi, Tonoi, I, I'll introduce Tonoi as we go toward the end. So uh, before Tonoi speaks, I'll introduce Tonoi. So now, so we have done work. We have done work with uh, arsenic removal uh, a lot using nanomaterial. So we can actually get a very good removal using arsenic. You know, so we get, we can remove very, very well. So we can keep it below, you know, 10 microgram per liter very, very effectively. Because the last one, as you can see on your right hand curve, it has exceeded, it, it has not treated well. But thing is, it's still removed a lot, but normally you do not have that much arsenic in your drinking water. Typically 300 or so microgram is very common in Assam water also. So, now, how does it work? So it is a basic electron transfer you know, issue. So it is a reducing agent. So this is a very classic paper. Anybody working with uh, the nanotechnology should be reading this paper. So from 2014. So, uh, so I'll be sending the slides to you. So possibly, uh, you know, uh, you can receive those slides in a PDF form. So now, so this is basic, you know, redox reaction, how the reaction takes place. I'm not going to get into details, but why I'm highlighting this, 
because understanding these concepts are important because that way you can know whether a, whether a particular nanomaterial is going to work in a particular situation or not. I think that's important to understand the theoretical aspect. So once you know the theoretical aspect, it will be easier for us to create uh, nanomaterials. So you can use it for remediation and other aspects. These nanomaterials are already being used. Very easy to inject. You know, of course, not. I will not say very easy to inject. Or oh, take it. Take the word. Okay, easy to inject. But there are certain issues to inject it. So you know, they have been already been using nanomaterial for different purposes or nano-based products. You know, they mix it with either oil or some kind of uh, your soapy material, detergent, edible detergent. So also uh, they can mix it with molasses. You know, there are different compounds being used to mix it up such that they're emulsified, they're dispersed. So typically when you produce nanomaterial, you will see them agglomerated like this. They are there they, because of Van der Waals force between them. So they agglomerate very quickly. So, but then to separate them, you can put a polymer coating. That's what we have done. Or you can use, as I said, you can use a detergent. A lot of detergents being used, you know. So uh, you, you can buy those detergents or possibly that can be a resource. How, what kind of detergent can you use, you know, to, to disperse nanomaterial? There are so many plant-based detergents which we can possibly use. And that's the whole reason I'm bringing this up. So I'd like to hear some ideas from you. And my idea is to introduce this thing today. Kanoyan will be introducing thing. Then as you set up this experiment, we'll, we'll like to come back and interact with you, you know, in, in more details on an individual basis. So now you can remove arsenic and uh, other organic contaminants very, very easily, very, very efficiently by coating them. So you know, this is one of the examples how plant-based materials are being used from soybean oil. You can synthesize these polymers. You know, we have done this. So, so basically, so you can you create those polymers and you can synthesize those very easily. So that is something I'm really looking forward because Northeast and India and that part, you know, has uh, so much potential, so much. Uh, nature-based materials that we can use for this kinds of this person not only for synthesis basic synthesis of nanomaterial but also for this person of nanomaterial which is a major problem this person is a major issue in nanomaterial so you can also encapsulate them we, we have encapsulated them we have put them like this looks like kind of a small eggs so we create the egg cell and put the nanomaterial inside as you can see i on the right hand side diagram i have you know, circle the nanomaterial with blue color. So that capsule you see, egg-like capsule you see, those are made from polymers. And this polymers alginate is a plant-based material. So, you know, that is something we can also look into whether what kind of material can we use to create such polymers. So there are applications in self-healing concrete being made, you know, so using nanomaterial, so it basically, if there's a crack in concrete, I know in the last, uh, last earthquake, a lot of buildings had crack in Assam, uh, crack. So this material, if we use this nanomaterial, so they will be basically self-healing after the crack, depending upon how big the crack is. Small cracks will be self-healing. That would be so nice because you don't have to worry about it. So they also, they are putting sensors and everything. So right now, you must be worried after the earthquake whether your your you know flat is safe or not. So these are the things when you construct the building. If you put sensors, nano-based sensors, now that will tell us whether there have been some compromise in terms of strength and others. So that is something you know. This already being done. They are putting rather than people measuring stuff, they are putting sensors in bridges and everything. Their real-time measurements are being done. So now, so there are others, you know, as you see there, we'll talk about composites in a minute. So this is something very interesting. So nano composites. So I, I have so far been talking about only nanomaterials. You know, nanomaterials can be iron, carbon nanotube, 
and different kinds of fiber, even you know, plant-based fibers can be nanomaterial. So rather than construct making a textile out of regular material, regular fiber, we can potentially use nanofiber to make clothing, etc. That has been already been done. So, but that can be something we can potentially do in Assam and Northeast and India. And people are doing it. It's not that, you know, I'm the first person to talk about it. People in India also are doing it. So only thing we need to catch up on that one. These are the potential areas for growth, definitely. So smart infrastructure, of course. So let's talk about nano hybrid quickly. So, so far I have talked about only nanomaterials, one single nanomaterial. But one single nanomaterial is it doesn't work very efficiently sometimes. As is, as I told you, one is a dispersion issue. This person is a problem. They do not, they do, they, they basically agglomerate together. If they agglomerate together, problem is you lose the basic basic property of nanomaterial, the surface area. Surface area is reduced. So you do not want that to happen. So as I said, we can use some kind of polymer, we can use detergents, and we can use oil, but that is not necessarily the best option. So if you want to enhance the process, maybe we can use another material, another nanomaterial, and combine them together to get the best result. That is called nano hybrid. So we have done some work with graphene. What is graphene? Graphene is simple. The casual, casual UU we use is kind of a graphene, kind of a graphene. So we can actually create graphene. You know, we do graphene is there every, every day. Alandu is a graphene. So uh, kind of, I'm not saying it is absolutely graphene, but also if you burn anything, you basically create graphene. It is like it's a carbon based material. Interesting part is, you know, it can be functionalized very easily you know, functionalized very, very easily, and it can work as a base material. So we have done this work a lot. So we have recently published a few papers on this, how, how this graphene oxide really helps in the whole process. How does it help in electron storage and electron transfer? So this is very, so it also helps the dispersion process because if you take graphene oxide, this have functions already, some acid functional groups and OH group out there. So they help you to bind the nanomaterial together. So you can actually get very dispersed nanomaterial. Here I'm showing you some Cydia, Cydia based nanomaterial, Cydia and graphene oxide based material. We have also done iron graphene based material. So, so basically uh, it's removed for fluoride removal. We have used it for fluoride removal. That's one of the problems in, in Guwahati itself. So we are going to see fluoride and arsenic issues in Guwahati itself. Also, rest of Assam and Northeast, we have this problem. So this is basically how it is constructed. I'm not going to get into details, but what I'm, as I show you the slides, you know, you realize that these are the things we have to look into as we do research. So you may not have the ability to do at Prajutis College itself, but we can collaborate. We can see where this is done. We can pay for the services, you know, uh, somebody will do it for us. So you need to plan it out. So you can do you can do nothing individually. You know, I literally say you can do nothing individually unless or you collaborate. So collaboration is important. So these are the you know how how dispersed these nanomaterial are. These are you know uh, electron microscopy uh, images. So. So we call it micrographs. So micrographs, you know, so we can we can have that. These are very important to have this because then only you can convince people. So you cannot do a black box research many times. Oh, I have done this, I got this result. That's a black box research. But I think important thing is to, if you want to convince people, you need to explain the science a little bit. Okay, so now uh, these are the, you know, other characterization we do, you know, to know what kind of, uh, what kind of compounds are there, in what form, those are very important because that explains it, helps you explain the, you know, mechanism in details. So as you can see, how this combined material helps you. So if you look at graphene oxide, the first one, ZO, graphene oxide itself doesn't remove any fluoride. But if you use only ceria, it removes a little bit, you know, about 12%. 
But if you combine these two together, graphene oxide and Syria, it removed 80%, 85% of it. So this is interesting. So just combining two materials, two materials together, we have been able to achieve a remarkable removal. So that is the key for thinking about the process. Can we combine two things? Maybe sometimes it will one, one particular work, one material work. But typically what we have found that the recent trend is to go towards hybrid material or, or you know, composites. So this is, uh, and what does it do basically? So as you can see, so, so uh, what does it do? It actually reduces the amount of dose you need you know, by combining these two things. So we have just done a dose, what kind of dose we need for that how much you need to remove effectively so so these are these are for you know uh, so also you can see the fast kinetics very very quickly happen that's very important because removing them is very very important as you can see they are they're removed in five minutes what does it mean that means if you have dirty water if you have water with fluoride if you let it pass through your filter system for five minutes you can get drinking water, you know, safe drinking water. That's important. That time needs to be less, as less as possible to treat, you know, uh, some chemicals or contaminants. Now, these are, these are the basic part of, I'm not going to get into details, but we'll talk about a little bit of experimental design after Tonoi shows you the uh, lab. So then only to maybe talk a little bit more about this, how to go about, how to design an experiment, what kind of parameters you need to look into. So these are different effects of pH and others to look into, you know. So that really tells you about the mechanism and others. We can we can find out. So also we need to look into impact of other cations and anions. You know, we do in the lab in a pure, it's a very simple experiment. We do it DI water and fluoride only. Then of course in real world you have all these compound present. So you have to select. You cannot put everything in the water because it will complicate your matter. Possibly you will not be able to complete the experiment in your lifetime. So you need to optimize this experiment. So that is the experimental design part. Rather than, rather than thinking as you go, I think it is, it is a good idea to have a clear idea what exactly we are going to do in the, in, the, in the process. So in the initial stage itself, an experiment may not go the way you think it should go, but then it will modify, but you need to have a clear plan, very, very strategic plan. We need to develop that. So these are ionic strength studies. So these are basically overall absorption study, how much absorption we get. Uh, this is very remarkable. It may, it may see, see, look small, 8.61 milligram per gram. This is a very good removal of fluoride, actually. If you look at even uh, activated alumina that is commonly used, that only removes about four or five milligram per gram. So that's important to recognize. Okay. So what we'll do? I'll I'll stop here at this time. I'll let Tanoy uh, so show you some talk talk about his part and show you some of the uh, things in our lab and how you can construct it. So what uh, what Tanoy and we talk? Tanoy is going to talk about the sophisticated. You can have a very sophisticated instrumentation. But if you do not have that, or you, you have, do not have the resources to have that, what can you do? So now, Tonoi will start on that one. So uh, let Tonoi finish it, then we'll come back to more of an inter interactive session after that. But Tonoi, you can take it over. Sir, uh, sir may I introduce him first? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Go ahead. OK, OK. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So uh, we have amongst us another personal, eminent personality uh, who is also the pride of Assam, Dr. Tonal Kumandas. He is presently contributing through his works in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, North Dakota State University. Das has completed his B.Sc. in Agriculture from the Dhan Chandra Krishi Vishwa Vidyalay of West Bengal from 2008 to 2012 in India. He further received his Master's in Soil Science from Punjab Agricultural University, Ludhiana, in 2014, and pursued his PhD in Environmental and Conservation Sciences from North Dakota State University of Fargo. 
His research interests include on developing efficient and feasible technology for providing safe drinking water, designing and synthesis of nanomaterial for environmental application, and remediation and stabilization of metal, metal contamination from groundwater and soil. He has been conferred with many awards and honors, which include the award of ICAR NS International Fellowship for pursuing PhD by the Indian Council of Agricultural Research in 2016 to 2019, and he also qualified the National Eligibility Test in Soil Science in 2014, and was awarded the Junior Research Fellowship by the ICAR for NSC from 2012 to 2014 and also conferred with the University Merit Scholarship by the Government of West Bengal for BSc in 2008 to 2012. He is an active member of American Water Works Association, World Water Federation and Sustainable Nanotechnology Organization. He also volunteered and demonstrated research outcomes in Farmers Fair organized by the Punjab Agriculture University in 2013 and 2014. He has also rural agricultural work experience for six months at the village conducted by the BCKB during his PhD program. He is also the lifetime member of Social Workers Association in Punjab Agriculture University and was an active leader in the National Service Scheme at Vidhan Chandra Krishi Vishwa from 2008 to 2010. He has contributed a lot to the research field of environmental chemistry and soil science by publishing high impact factor research papers in most reputed international and national journals. We are indeed lucky and blessed to have you amongst us, sir. Now, I request Dr. Tony Kumar Das to con kindly continue with his speech. Over to you, sir. Yeah, before Tonoi, Tonoi starts, I would like to add that Tonoi just accepted a position, postdoctoral position in UCLA, University of California, LA, Los Angeles. So he'll be starting from August 1st. So, so just, yeah, Tono, it is yours. Go ahead, Tono. Thank you for the, the very detailed introduction and all of these things. So I think Dr. Achinda already covered all the aspect of nanotechnology. So I will here to talk about the bad things, means when we do the work in the lab, what should we do? And what are the thing? You can see my screen, right? Yeah, just coming up. Yes, sir, it's visible. Okay, okay. sure. So go on. Okay. Okay, so uh, Mm, the, the, the thing will, I will say today, how we can work safely with engineer nanomaterial in the lab. Now, why this is important? So first, this is important because this is about safety of the people who are working because nanomaterial are considered to be toxic because of their particle size. And sometimes we don't know all the properties of nanomaterial and we don't know what will happen in the long term exposure. And this is the safety part of it. And the another aspect of this thing that as we do these experiments, what we are doing, we are training ourselves for our future industry market. So we may in future work in a lab or in an industrial setting or nano manufacturing facility. Being this good practice of this thing is very important because that will help to not only save you for any exposure also maintaining a good quality product and cross-contamination through these practices. So how we can expose to nano when we work in a lab? The exposure route. One is ingestion. Second thing is dermal. And other one is the inhalation. So that means if your nanomaterial take attach on your skin, it can be your dermal one, or you can drink it like, Sometimes what happens, people keep food in the lab and open the box and into nanometer in the air, or you put your dirty hand on your food, and that the way it, you can, it can be go to your stomach. And the most important thing is the inhalation. Means, I think due to the COVID, we are very aware about this airborne thing. And this nanometer is there for, for the, from the beginning, like the powder nanomaterial, when we just dust it off, 
is suspended in the air and remain there. So if we are working in a room, there's a lot of suspended nanomaterial, and we inhale those nanomaterial, and over time it can be deposited in our lungs. So as you see, this nanomaterial this through like the dermal, it can do the skin, it can block your the air follicles entry, and it can also enter in, into into your body and the cell. The second thing is a lungs, so it can be deposited on your lungs and even it can be penetrated to your lung and mixed in your body and go to the cell. And the other one is you, if you eat it or drink it through any other medium. So all those exposure make a people very vulnerable for their health. So, and that's why we need to have a good practice in our lab when you work with nano. So nano is a little bit of different when we work with the normal toxic chemical, most of the good lab practice prevented. We have to be little careful when you're working with nano. Now, the first thing we, when we start with nano is we need a material safety data sheet. So what is the material safety data sheet? It's nothing but is kind of our prescription, our a first aid thing. So like we, when we start with any nanomaterial, we need the information, what is the product, what is the possible toxicity it can have? If you spill, means if you break a, or if you throw some nanomaterial in the lab, or there is a spill in the lab, how we can contain this? Or in accidentally, if you eat it, or it go to in your eyes or anything. So all this type of information can be in your material safety data sheet. So whenever we start with any nanomaterial, even you synthesize it, if, if you synthesize it, we can look online and find the material safety data sheet and keep in the lab. So that will help us. So any kind of, if something goes wrong, we can immediately see that sheet and know what is our first measurements should we take. So this piece of information needed to be in the lab when we started with nano. So it's only not for nano, it's true for any chemical also. The second thing is the personal protective equipment, the PPE we call it. So it's a good, so most of the thing we use in the normal in the lab, but nano is little bit, we have to more cautious for nano, like lab coat, gloves, safety glass, and masks. So these are the, I think lab coat, gloves, and safety glass is the common thing. When you work in a lab, we have to wear it, but for nano is more important because these are the route we can expose to. And this is a kind of a very normal picture when you work in a lab. This, this should be your attire for working in a lab. Like you have a long pant, clothes, shoe, and long lab coat, having this eyeglass and gloves. For nano, uh, only another important thing is the mask or respirator. Because as I said, most of the nano may be, the major exposure of the nano when you're working in the lab is the air or inhalation of nanoparticles. So, that will be the one of the most protective measure we can take. Now there's a different type of mask. So a normal face mask work for nano. I'll say it works somewhat, but it will not work that good. So these are the few respirator marks normally recommended when you work with nano. The most common and simple one they recommended that, so depending on different things, the N95 marks, this is very standard uh, mask. If you work with nano, you can wear it and it will prevent most of your nanoparticle entering in your body. And uh, this recommendation mainly I taking it from this National Institute of the NEOS, say US federal agency who take care of uh, workplace occupational health and hazard. So they recommend this, this type of mask will work. So even you don't have this respirator mask, even you have a simple N95 mask, that will work. Now, these are the very common thing uh, we have to keep in remember when we means not only having the proper uh, PPE, we have to know the right way to wear it and use it. So like this picture, you can see that they have the gloves, they have the lab coat, but it's an incorrect one because part of your uh, skin is open. So when we work with this nano, this can be in touch on your hand and it, you got a dermal exposure. So the right way to use it 
is this so they your there should be no gap between your hand and the glove so all thing will be covered and when we work like in the open space with this weighing some nanomaterial we should use a mask because this is uh, this, uh, most of the time you work with powder nanomaterial and depending on what type of application maybe some water treatment it may have some biological experiment like exposed to some uh, mice or anything biological study but we normally weigh the nanometer in a balance and this is the time they start to fly because they, they build up static and it's a very tiny particle so we some put something and it's fly and it's become airborne and that when we expose our cell most so this is the area the best way you should wear a mask and um, the other thing i will say that when we, you set up a lab make uh, we try to do this measurement like scaling thing not in the middle of the lab it should be one side of the lab should be isolated from the rest of the lab and that area should have good ventilation because that way we re can reduce the exposure of this nanomaterial we were working in the lab now uh, uh, i'll show you a small experiment done by a very good renowned scientist who worked this nanomaterial health and hazard dr kantis tesai uh, in the experiment like this is the very classic experiment even you can do it to just know that how nanomaterial are spread when you are working so they use a simple uh, aluminium oxide nanomaterial this looks white it's have a particle size of 45 nanometer now if we have a lot of them it's visible by its white color but if you have like few of this nanoparticle attached to your hand it cannot be visible and because this is particle size is very small now what they did they dye this particle some fluorescent color now in the fluorescent light this can be visible so we can trace back what is this nanoparticle now what they did they do some experiment like a normal experiment like owing some nanomaterial do start like work with this nanomaterial for 20 to 30 minutes wearing a gloves and everything then they come back and they want to see so if you say that you can say that i have already gloves so i should be good and the lab, the gloves should look clean so okay i can reuse it another time i may just keep it but when you put in a fluorescent light then you can see there's a lot of nanomaterial attached to your hand even in your shirt now what happened many times we do a mistake we complete a experiment and we move to another part of the lab and start to doing another thing so as we touch different part of the lab, different instrument, different glass oil, we start to contaminate them. Even if you open your lab door using these gloves, you contaminate the lab door and next time a person coming without the gloves, he, he can touch it. So it's like very much like, like this COVID virus is spreading, like clean your surface. So this is because COVID virus is also a kind of a nano size maintenance organism. So this gives you an idea like, how it can spread it even is not visible but it is everywhere in the lab so that's why i whenever you work with nano you want a lab coat and whenever we done we leave the lab coat in the lab before we leave in the lab so we cannot move around doing during the experiment using the same gloves same lab coat within the building so that will can be spread the nanometer throughout your whole building and this is maybe the aluminum oxide is not a toxic nanomaterial but we don't know. Sometimes we work with toxic nanomaterial. But so as a safe side, we, we have to know that what material you are working and based on that, you have to make best judgment what you need to do. Now, the second important, so that, that is, is your personal protection. Now, the second important area is the work area. So that's mean how you set, how you set up your lab. So I will say, I present a very sophisticated thing, but we can do in a very simple way also. So the most recommended thing for like some pyrophoric or uh, some toxic nanomaterial, uh, they recommend to use a glove box. So nothing goes out, everything they contain. So the, the key idea of the work area, 
isolation and the ventilation. So how isolated we can keep that work area from the rest of the lab and how good ventilation we can provide to the lab. So this will be the two very important criteria when we set up a nano lab. So that's how this nano lab is different than a normal chemical experimental lab. And this is the area you want to work. So needing a glass pot is not the every time important. So if you work with some biological stuff, you can use a biological safety cabinet. This is also have a good ventilation and filter. And as we work inside, most of the thing remain inside is not coming outside. Other uh, very common thing we most of the chemi chemistry lab have a few mood. So we should try to do all of this synthesis or handling of this nanomaterial inside the fume. And one of the thing I think researchers also observed and did that when you work in a fume mode, we have to make sure we cannot keep open, wide open the fume mode all the way up. We have to keep as low as possible because if we keep it more open and that will be a cross airflow happen and that can take out your nanomaterial from inside the fume mode to the outside uh, area. But this is very good workplace to work means if you synthesizing anything or if you like making some mixture or transferring your nanomaterial from one container to another container you should do it in the fume mode and all the time wear a mask so that is the thing now how we can handle nano so experiment we are doing in the lab so the best way, if you have a dry particle, try to do those experiment in a liquid phase. Means you put your nanometer in a water or some kind of solution, make a oil mixture and try to uh, do your treatment in the liquid phase. Because when we put in a liquid phase, it's not airborne anymore. So you will reduce a lot of exposure hazard from this nanomaterial if you put in a liquid phase. And the second thing, like never work nanomaterial in a beaker or something put your nanomaterial in a beaker and try to keep it and weighing it always put in a some close container like a vials or test tube not test tube like centrifuge tube or a small bottle so whenever you need it you will just scoop it out and whenever you are done you just close it another thing i will show it when, during the lab tour uh, that is the static gun so this is a very thing because as this develop uh, static uh, energy inside the area when you're working during the weighing of nanomaterial if you use this gun most of the static will gone and your nanometer will not fly as uh, without the static gun so this is a good way to reduce the um, the flying of nanomaterial in the lab then the three very important thing when you work in the uh, nanomaterial first thing is the labeling like whenever you put nanometer you have to label very properly like saying not like nano like if you have a zinc oxide you have nano zinc oxide so if you have nano zinc oxide we have to label as a nano zinc oxide or if you have some specific chemical name put it in there second thing is the cleaning so whenever you work with nano in the bench space even we take all the measures still there will be some nanomaterial fly and or maybe it for your brain so that the easiest way you can take a wet piece of white and just clean it because by doing that we take most of the like transferring in kind of with the liquid phase and attaching them so it will not fly again so never dust off so if you work in nano so if you see some dirty area don't use a dry cloth and just dust it off because during the dusting off we what we are doing we making this material in the airborne and we make ourselves to put some more nanometer in that room. The last thing is the transportation. Whenever we do a transportation nanomaterial, like simply if you want to take from one room to another room, and it is like a big amount, like you are transporting something 200, 300 gram of material, don't do it in a simple bigger or just by hand. Because it may happen if you can. Uh, if off or something you can fill off and that the nanomaterial will be spreading everywhere so normally whenever we want to transport it or take it from one room to another take proper precaution 
if you transporting from one building to another put in a double container like one maybe the glass and outside a plastic container and that way we make it more safe during the transportation of this material i think that's i all have I, if you have any specific question like how to do it what to do it and means i say a lot of very specific thing i know this is not sometimes very difficult to have it or that facility follow it but there's always an alternative way to do this thing if you understand the how these things spread the principle of thing we can figure it out a way to make that uh, safety measure implemented in the lab with that i thank you everyone to listening to me and this is our lab group and i think if time permit i also give you a lab tool like to show you how we set it up in here in the lab our work area uh, our safety measure we are taking during our work and our experimental area thing thank you Dr. Bhir, your mic is on. Dr. Bhir, mute. Sir, you're on. Dr. Bhir, you're on. Dr. Bhir, you're on. Dr. Bhir, you're on. Sorry, I'm on. Sorry, I was telling Tanoi that he can show a little bit of the instrument. And showing the whole lab will consume a lot of time. Tanoi, at least you can show them the basics, maybe five minutes or so. And one of the instruments that we all need if we are to do an experiment is a shaker. I think shaker will be very important to know to just, you know, show it okay, to them so as well. And show them the lab a little bit. This is our specific nano lab. So Tano mm -hmm. is there. So Tano, you can show it to you, the lab a little bit, how we set up the stuff. Okay, sure. And then okay. Maybe take five, five, five minutes or so. Then we can get into question and answer possibly. or. I'll quickly show some slides on experimental design. Okay, sure. Let me log in through my mobile phone. That will then I can move easily. Okay. So why don't I do one? So okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Log, do that load loading here. In the meantime, if anybody has question, go ahead. Till now, I know Dr. Borthakur has asked a question about uh, uh, you know this you know, compatibility of nanomaterial, which has affinity for. Uh, certain receptors so we do not work in that area but there are yes there are people are working a lot on covid uh, viruses you know certain virus, viruses so there have been work done so definitely yeah we can we can uh, dr sir uh, uh, i mean uh, uh, deb circle has asked a question the cost of this nanomaterial we can talk about it yeah the cost of nanomaterial right now, this is the thing. The cost of nanomaterial, it may appear very high at this time, but cost will come down. Look at your TV, how expensive it was and what it is today. You can just go to the store and buy a TV right now. Availability and cost will go down over time because it is the new technology. It, it, it is not, uh, not less expensive at this time. But if you look at agriculture sector, agriculture sector, even India is having using nanotechnology already in agricultural, you know, production. So this is affordable. Healthcare is affordable. Cancer treatment, very affordable. So, but remediation and all this still a little bit cost prohibitive, but it will come down soon. So that's. Dr. Trabi, I'm ready. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Tanoi. Yeah, you can see it, right? Yes, go ahead. So, like, I can give you the tip thing, like, so this is our, like, lab entry. So, as we enter in the lab, so in the left hand, we have our, this is the preparation room. As we said, that we keep this area isolated from the rest of the lab to make this all of the, we put our balance here. So, we do this nanomaterial weighing stuff here. As, as we're talking about the static gun, we use this to reduce static, so it's less airborne. And in here, we have our fume hood. 
where we do most of our experimental like during synthesis or we want to transfer any nanomaterial to any phase so this is our fume hood area so i can show the static gun one more time yeah sure so this is yeah. the static okay. gun yeah yeah it is not for, yeah it is a static gun looks like a gun it remove the static electricity such that particles will not fly that's very important yes and i will never recommend anybody working without a mask or without proper safety nano material because your lung will be affected for sure if you have particle working like that okay can i go ahead yeah so as you see that this is our rest of the lab but we select this room out of this lab so that's why most of the staff remain here and we have a good ventilation in this point so one thing is is the fume hood is here and the other thing we have and many of those lab may have we have been another exhaust system in here so what we do if we do any experiment then small experiment we can put that exhaust system out working in a lab bench and that can take out most of the nanomaterial out of the room can you focus the focus the thing a little bit more yeah just yeah we yeah. cannot see so this is this is the one it's a portable one you say you can move it around yeah we can move it around and put it wherever it's needed it's yeah. like a a big arm like structure mm -hmm. so this this part is the most of the that part and i think we have a another thing is a shaker so it's a custom made and we mostly use for our removal study so if i turn it on so the can... thing is very important to overcome the mass transfer resistance you can do it manually shake it or we keep it keep it static that's not going to work very well but second mm -hmm. this is very easy to make uh, you know anybody interested i can send you the detailed diagram and what kind of motors you need and it will not cost you too much also possibly for you know 10000 or 15000 rupees you can make one of those very easily you know so yes that's true and another thing i want to mention about the balance so when you work with nanomaterials so most of the time we were measuring like some 10 and 10 mg 20 mg very little amount of this material so it is very important we keep this area free from any vibration or anything and keep our balance always like calibrated that's we can get maximum out of it because a uh, few milligram like 5 milligram difference can a huge effect on your treatment so more precise we can make more good and consistent result we can get and i think this is the the other part yeah. and sure. we have a few instruments here i can just quickly show so this is the we call it jitter sizer so we can measure like it's a quick instrument to immediately after synthesis we can measure the hydrodynamic diameter and the surface charge of the material whatever we have in the lab and this is our rest of the lab like we have some chemical we have some bench space so yeah when we work with nano most of the stuff we work there in here we just store our sample or do a calculation if you run something or you do a instrumental measurement that of the thing so we keep this main lab as much as free from nano material than the the small room mm -hmm. and i think i can show you that the other room we have in the lab so now this room we have a separate door and it's totally isolated from the rest of the lab and the reason we have this room isolated because this is where we do our biological work so we have our biological safety cabinet and we have a separate sink and everything it's very important because that will reduce our contamination and as we work with nano some nano material already air born there so we keep separate so there is nothing coming to contaminate our biological study so that's why this room is mostly separated from the rest of the lab and uh, we have other lab uh, upstairs so those do, do where we do most of those analyses like we have icp we have double as we have spectrophotometer and uh, so this lab specifically this means the name of this lab is itself nano impact lab so we do most of the nano lab here and keep it separated from the other lab as much as possible so i think that's what we have in this lab that right, dr do you want to show yeah. oh, i think no i think that this is good to know thank you yeah, yeah thank sure. you yeah i i we have other that you can talk more about it if you get into details 
if you have to, I know we are showing certain things, certain things will be difficult to obtain, it will be very expensive, but don't worry about the expense part of it. I mean, expense, we can work on the expense part. I think thinking about having the concept of a good lab is important because we can set it up. And there are a lot of resources, actually. If you for notice, if you apply for grants, it is right now is a very good time to apply for grants and everything. So that lab, I know President's College is working on getting some additional grants. So I think that's a very good thing. So uh, it, it, it can be combined with other lab also. But only thing, the safety part is very, very important. We need to recognize that nanomaterials are not regular, regular materials. So now I'll possibly spend 10 more minutes to just to quickly go through an experimental design. I know there are a lot of questions. We can go ahead and answer those questions. So my objective of today's presentation, our objective, Tanoi and our objective is that I know there are about 100 people who st we started with, you know, out of that, if we get three people, four people, five people really getting into this research, I think that will be great. That will be the best success rate we can think of. Let's think about it. You know, don't think it is complicated. You know, everything is complicated. If you want to do something easy, don't even think about science. You know, the easy is not the way. You know, easy is not the way we are going to make a difference. I think difficult, we have to think about difficult things. So let me spend quickly 10 more minutes about the basics of experimental design. You know, I talked about this before, but I just want to re-emphasize the generalistic, very general experimental design procedure. And as I say, if anybody is interested, so we can have weekly meeting, we can have bi-weekly meeting or monthly meeting, you know, with your group, we can start working on some experiments together. So uh, that's the whole idea. Uh, but don't do it for doing sake. I want to do something, but you need to be prepared for a long haul. You need to, it doesn't happen in one month or two months. It'll take a year or two to get to the final results. So let me share the screen with you. Yeah, so this is an experimental design. You can see the slide, right? Yes. Yes, okay. sir. So how to get from the experimental design to a journal paper? Because finally, unless already published, your work is useless. So you have to publish somewhere. People, people need to know what you are doing, such that nobody unnecessarily spends time on doing the same thing. Because if we if everybody does the same thing, we'll never progress. So we need to we need to, you know. Uh, basically, uh, publicize this work, you know, information dissemination is very, very important. So <clears throat> I think, I think, as you say, this is, you have to really have a plan experiment. So very much, very much plan experiment. Some observation will come, but you need to have a hypothesis driven experiment. Very, very important. You need to really have a hypothesis. I'll send you the slides. Having a hypothesis is very important. Remember, your hypothesis may be right or wrong, but it should be based on scientific something science. Okay, some science. So then you need to plan it, you need to have a protocol, you need to run it, first write, do some preliminary work. You can simply say right now, say take for example, uh, I don't know the scientific name for that. Say take for example, you have Posotia, one of the weeds you have. Posotia is known to be insecticidal. Now, it also contains a lot of polyphenols. So maybe you can use that plant to synthesize nanomaterial. You have seen the two videos we have sent you. So now, uh, so you can synthesize nanomaterial. But what you can do before spending a lot of money on that one, maybe we can take a small sample and try it out whether it does happen or not. Then with the preliminary data, oh, this is happening. Let's try it out, you know. So that is not going to preliminary work also may take a lot of time. It may take months to do it because you may have to change pH, you may have to change temperature, you know, a lot of things need to be done. And those need to be recorded, of course, you know. So, so basically these are, you know, uh, important thing that we are going to prove the hypothesis, okay? We need to uh, we need write down the hypothesis, we are going to prove it, okay? So one of the important thing, as I said, 
experimental size need to be important you need to be effort, you need to have the time money and space to do this very very, very important okay and also you need to have a statistical framework for this one many times we ignore statistics too they all do it i have seen people who have done only one experiment and trying to report data i have seen people doing duplicates oh i have done duplicates duplicate doesn't mean anything unless already you have three samples three replicates or more your experiment is not right i people say oh, we don't have that much resources well you cut down on some of that stuff you have to have replicates three replicates so that you can find out standard deviation of the stuff you know you cannot report anything on duplicates so that is very important to understand okay keep things simple don't complicate matter i'll give you a simple example for that so take for example if you're investigating effect of iron nanomaterial on rice crop due to uh, you know so uh, during flooding season so now do not put crude oil pollution or social habits as a parameter. Look into only nano impacts. Well, that's very important. Now, so you need to have a control. I'll give you a simpler example, non-nano example. So if you are studying effect of freezing, cold temperature, you know, Assam is going to go to possibly get out with the climate change. Assam is also going to possibly experience freezing very soon. Looks like temperature is so changing. So then, you need to not only try some freezing experiment, you need to have some control which are not exposed to freezing. So that's important. I suppose you need to have designed the controls. You know, it's very important to design the main experiment and design the controls. Controls are the key for proper results. Now, sample size. So if you're studying effect of iron nanomaterials on rice, you need to set up several pots of rice. I talked about it not just one or two you need to have at least three replicates remember that more you have better because some of them will not survive possibly so but at the same time you have limitation of space limitation of money limitation of time so we need to work that out okay a lot you know time is very important okay so you need to understand you know from the beginning itself how much time we need do i have enough time so you are going for a conference next month. Possibly, you know, don't think about doing an experiment right now for your ex conference next month. That's not a good idea. You may be able to present something, but you are not only fooling others, you're fooling yourself. That's not a good idea at all. That is not ethical to do this, okay? So of course, detailed notebook is very important. Whatever you see, write it down. Doesn't matter, never erase anything. Write everything down. Never try to get, oh, this is wrong. I will not enter this. No, enter the wrong stuff also. Those may come out pretty handy. Okay. So I think collecting data. So you need to, you know, be quantitative in your parameters. You need to write as many quantitative parameters. Okay. Now, for me, this is my la almost the last slide. So formulating conclusion, that's the important part. You can do a lot of research without the conclusions, you know. You need to think about explanation. Your experiment may not go the right way. You're thinking that if you put iron nanomaterial into rice, rice will rice grain will have a lot of iron. Didn't happen. You know, you found more zinc in there rather than iron. Why did it happen? I think there must be an explanation for that. I think explaining that is very important. Your hypothesis may not be proven. You know, you might thought you thought it's going to happen this way. You know, you ended up going somewhere else. You know. You thought of going for dinner in a particular place, but there's so much traffic jam that you decided to go somewhere else. You know? So that is what it is. So basically, you know, why did you go there? You know the other restaurant is also equally good. So those are those explanations are very, very important, I suppose. So publication, we can talk more about this publication, but I wanted to wanted you to know that publications are very, very important. You know, why do you publish? Because people need to know your work, you know. People need to know what you have done. People don't have to replicate. So you need to find out the best feasibility. You want to be, to be visible. You know, there are so many online, you know, you pay, you know, thousand rupees, you can publish somewhere. Don't even think of those. Those are money-making business and nobody. Do you think I look at those journals? No, I don't look at the journal. Do I cite those papers? No, I don't cite those papers. Because those does not go through a review process. 
So I don't care about, you know, you publishing a paper paying 10,000 rupees somewhere. I don't care about it. So, you know, we don't, I mean, when I say I, we mean we, we don't care about it. Nobody cares about that kind of research because those are not referring, you know, nobody has looked into this proper. They do it for business, you know. So impact factors are important because that tells you how many people are going to look into this one. Also citation, how many citations you're going to get potentially, that's very important. So who handles it? Don't send it to the wrong editor. Also turnaround period, if some journal takes two years to publish it, forget those journals. Those are dead journals, you know. Some of them are very good, but even like journal like Science, Nature, they, they give you a response within a week. Okay, we are going to review your paper. Then they will take another month to review it, and you're done. So that's very important to think, okay? So this is, these are the article information. Each article have those information, one it was submitted, one it was published. Those are very, very important, okay? So of course, you need to think about intellectual property. Then of course, patenting is important, but once you submit the patent, you can publish it very easily, okay? So this is the group as Donoy has shown you the picture. But important thing you need to recognize, this is my small group. This is not a very big, big group, actually. So different times. So top one is the most recent one. But what is important is, as you can see, there are so many people around it. It is not only our group who has done it. All the small pictures you see around, there are people from around the world. So as you can see here, you know, so uh, he's, you know, we, we have different people. So he's from Nehu. You know, so then uh, we have uh, from uh, this one, Downtown University, we have uh, Sunandan. So uh, these are the people who, who, can, who really contributed. It's, it's a global effort, it's a combined effort. And we have uh, Dr. Saha from Bengal, West Bengal. So these are people who contributed a lot in the whole process. So we do it together. This is not a one person work. So I'll stop here. So this is the work. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. So what we'll do now, I would like to hear from you, you know, what kind of uh, uh, questions do you have? I think so, there's some question in the chat box. Sure. So let's let's go through them possibly, you know. Uh, I think I answered Dr. Borthakur's question. So we talked about cost. So what is the probability of having, I think this is from Sangita Das, what's the probability of having health hazard by consuming water purified to nanofilters and nan nanotechnology? Tanoi, do you want to answer the question? Yes, yeah, sure. So there is not too much technology is already available in the market which have nano, but in US what happened when a technology come which have nano in your filter, they go extensive review process like if any nanomaterial is leaching out or not so this area is not there is no established regulation yet like how much nanomaterial can be there but most of the thing the product is coming in the market they go a review process to over time if your nanomaterial leaching out or not and if it's leaching out they put a proper measurement in place this is how they are doing now is there will be a health hazard yes if you have a lot of nanomaterials start to leaching out from your system there may be a health hazard one from the nano and the second thing will be your nano is not only nano now it have a lot of contaminant so a small particle having already removed some contaminant and you start to consume it so in that extent yeah it can cause some health hazard but I think then precaution already has in place to make sure this doesn't happen. Yeah. Also, the amount, of, also the amount of nanomaterial present is very minimal. Typically, we have now single single particle ICP through which you can measure nanomaterial present in there. I think that's a very pertinent point. If you are trying to introduce some technology, you want to make sure this is not hazardous for people. I think typically that doesn't happen in many countries. People develop a technology. Tomorrow, say I develop a technology. I talk to Dr. Kolita. Dr. Kolita, can I install it in the village? Dr. Kolita say, let's go together. We install it. Nobody questions us because Dr. Kolita is from Guwahati University and somebody from Pranjit College, you know, such good institute, everybody coming together. 
you know, there must be a good thing, right? People believe in you. I think this is our part to make sure, our responsibility to make sure that, you know, that this thing doesn't go into the part, uh, you know, water. I think that's what exactly we do. We uh, we actually are is publishing a new paper on arsenic, which will actually talk about that aspect of it. You know, uh, whether this nanomaterial really affect you. Not necessarily it is the nanomaterial present, also whether nanomaterials are going to dissolve this material back. I think that's very important to understand. Also, nanomaterial not only reacts with arsenic, for example, it may react with other contaminants. It may form a new nanomaterial in the process. So those are the things you need to understand and we need to find out. Now, question is, will, will we get a perfect system? Possibly not. If you look at your water bottles, uh, water bottles that you drink, you know, from where you drink, what are, what are the plastic bottle, plastic contains plasticizers, okay? So plasticizers, so plasticizers are bad. Now, will you stop drinking from the bottle? Possibly not. You limit it. You limit it. But question is, is a cost benefit issue. How much it, it is? I think you select the lesser of the evils. Will consuming arsenic at a high concentration affect me more or a potential one or two nanometers affect me more? I think that is the something we need to answer. Possibly there are not enough studies done, but at the same time, you know, take for example, silver nanoparticle. The silver nanoparticle are known to be non-toxic. People are using it, that's why, you know. But down the road, will there be any effect? We don't know. That may be the possibility, okay? I think it's a long answer to a short question. So there's also a question from Luna Sarma. I know, uh, may I know how does nanotechnology work in drug delivery? You know, so there are different ways of drug delivery. If you look at just Google about mRNA, this new Pfizer technology or Moderna technology, you will find how it is delivered. Uh, typically, it is, you know, you functionalize this nanomaterial. Take, for example, you can use iron based material to deliver content. You know, so you functionalize that with, uh, with target specific functionalizing agent. So if you need something to be delivered to the kidney, so it can, it can deliver in the kidney. So that's why you see less impact uh, of this. You know, there are a lot of papers being published. You know, one of the things I'll suggest you to do, rather than using regular Google, I think I'll be using Google Scholar. You know, if you don't have any other, you know, uh, access to any other library function, I think Google Scholar will be the best one to look into that one. There are a lot of work being done in that area. So now, do you have any other suggestion for what, is in addition to Google Scholar, what, what additional stuff they can use if they do not subscribe to anything else? I think Google Scholar will be the best because that gives you the most of the best results, search. And yeah. Google Scholar will yeah. work very good. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Asif Rahman has asked a question in your YouTube video. In one of the last steps of preparation of nanomaterial, the particles are dried in a vacuum oven, yeah, for 24 hours in nitrogen environment, okay? What is the reason for using nitrogen-rich environment for drying process as well as in the preparation of uh, pres preservation or after period? So now you can answer that question, but you are the person who does it every day. Go ahead, answer that question. Okay, so the reason where means this is specifically because we are synthesizing zero valent iron and two reasons zero valent iron is pyrophoric so because it's a metallic iron if it's come in contact of air it will catch up fire or it will oxidize very quickly so the reason we put nitrogen so make the environment oxygen free so that's way it doesn't oxidize quickly or we didn't catch up catch up any fire and during the so we make it the nitrogen rich but also not oxygen completely free there will be very slight oxygen and that what they did they make a slight oxidation coating outside the particle and that will protect it from any further oxidation process so in simpler nitrogen to protect the nanoparticle from oxidation or catching any fire because it's a pyrophoric material so that is the one of the reason whenever we work with pyrophoric material 
means the material have potential have catching fire in if it come contact to air we normally use nitrogen as a inert gas so that is not oxidized or anything happen mm -hmm. yeah now, I, I even try, I can try it out without without uh, using you know, nitrogen gas it will catch fire be careful of that but what do we do we not only put nitrogen gas we also after that process we gradually introduce uh, air to the things such that there's a slight coating around it oxide coating around it it protects the material from catching fire after that you don't have to you can take it out if you have a coating on top of that one if, if you see ever synthesize that would be more than happy to help you all now many times you may not have that process with you you may not have a vacuum oven you may not have access to easy access to nitrogen gas you can preserve everything in liquid form you can put it in you know uh, some kind of alcohol you know so you can do that but thank you some country for telling the name of Posotia plant so you know scientific name so thank you so now uh, Luna Sharma again asks can nanoparticles be used to reduce carbon dioxide emission yes there are work being done there are work being done on carbon dioxide reduction because it's even simple thing you can do the activated carbon regular carbon can be converted to nanoform and you can use it for absorbing different gases you know not necessarily carbon dioxide gas but you can functionalize them and there are a lot of work being done to reduce carbon you know carbon dioxide you know so you you, you can just look it up you know i'll again use google scholar to look it up so uh, you know rahul Kalita has asked discrete nanometer diameter particles are deposited on the uh nasal refuse or completely committed by blood vessels and travel up to the uh, does that affect normal persons from using this technology uh yes you know so uh, typically our nose has hairs and everything it protects something but nanoparticles as you know if you want to imagine nanoparticle imagine your covid virus i think that's that's a good thing you know on a positive side of covid I don't have to explain what nanomaterial is, just a COVID, COVID virus. COVID virus anywhere from 80 to 120 nanometer size. So COVID virus is the nano, nanoparticle. So what do you do to protect yourself from COVID virus? So you don't go to close to the source, the another person. So that's one of the things. So you have to protect yourself. You have to have more, you know, ventilated room and you have to have at least N95 mask just wearing a mask you know just wearing a mask like you know this doesn't help you it has to be tightly fitted you know if you extensively work make sure you tightly fitted mask you get better ones so now you have one to sew it to them the mask that one not the n95 one one that we use in our lab that they do it with the proper fitting and everything do we have one okay. with you no no we, that's in the upstairs lab oh, okay sure okay sure so I think add of that question that so most of the what happened most of the nanotechnology when it comes to your consumer product or daily life product is doesn't come as a nano itself it comes with some substrate mm -hmm. as a LED technology TV technology you use a lot of nano things there but it's not comes as a powder so it's attached to something else so that way most of the things you reduce the major exposure route like if we use in a powder form so any product come in a powder form that is the most otherwise there is a not immediate exposure but in long run yes there may be some exposure through water or some soil or something else so so imagine uh, imagine coffee so coffee powder the so coffee powder has both nano and macro size particles so same thing now uh, also i think one of the things we need to be careful about the nano size fertilizers because that is something coming up very quickly and i think we need to really do something in india about protecting farmers because farmers think that these are good stuff and they do without protection they go spray you know insecticide pesticides and fertilizer i think that's going to affect and tono you talked about uh, and technology in India that is using nanotechnology right now, the spraying spraying technology. Yes, so I think in recent, I think in a month, Ipco bring a product, they call it nano urea. So they calling, so they use, I think some emulsifiers, they use liquid form and spray it. 
and yeah. they claiming it is kind of reducing your nitrogen requirement by 50% because most of the nitrogen efficiency i think is very low most of the thing we apply as a fertilizer is lost through the water yeah. or thing 90% yeah so i think yeah, so there is a product start to bring in the market and there's already some product like silver and titanium this is widely used without your knowing means yeah most of titanium the actually use it in lot of lot of sweets and all sweets paint sweets and all titanium nanoparticles are already used they because if you see a sweet which is like a very white there they have some white powder on top of that one you think they are sugar no they are not sugar typically they are using titanium uh, dioxide as a uh, you know it, it, it basically sparkles it gives a very good effect color so be careful of that you know so so yeah us also they did it but it is not banned uh, but is not desired uh, so then this one Tonoi talked about that is being introduced in India, agriculture sector, it, it is not using nanoparticles. What it does, when you spray something, when you spray something, spray urea, the particle size are very big. Now what they have done, they have modified the sprayer. The particles that is going, are going to come out from the sprayer is going to be nano sized now. They are going to be much more effective. So in nanotechnology not necessarily means hey, you have to produce some nanoparticle. It can be nano-sized droplets also. So I think the next question yeah. is are synthesized nanomaterial through green non-toxic? I think that depending on green chemistry, what you are using it. So sometimes green is not always green, not green because we always use some chemical. So if you use okay naturally occurring any material, it even become toxic because toxicity sometimes comes from your size, your shape. So yeah, you omitting maybe the tox chemical property of toxicity, but shape and shape, tox shape toxicity still be there. So we have to see if there is that thing happening or not. But yeah, green nanomaterial comparatively less toxic than the chemically synthesized material. Sure. Yeah. Possibly some of the some of the Ayurvedic medicine and Unani medicine possibly already use nanomaterials because if you look at basma being used, you know, being grind, more you grind, better is your medicine. Possibly they are using it already. You know, don't think nanomaterial nanomaterials are something new. You know, nature produces nanomaterial all the time. You know, uh, so so this is not necessarily bad. You know, now we have come to a phase where we are no longer considering nanomaterial to be toxic we consider nanomaterial to be safe and we are we think that we are ready to use them at this time so there's a question from i think let me answer rahul Kolita's question first i do not know whether antibodies are being made tonoy you may know whether antibodies are being made for fighting i do not know what will be the effect of nano antibodies because i do not know of that sorry i know I have no idea about that. But Sinmoy Kolita has asked a question, very pertinent question. How do you measure the iron content in a graphene oxide nanomaterial? We have done that. Don't know you can explain it possibly, not necessarily accurately. We have issues with that, but don't know you can explain that a little bit. Yeah, sure. So there's a two way you can do it. So the one way we digest the material in a strong acid and measure total iron content. So we use a strong hydrochloric acid, dissolve all the iron, and we did a mass balance. And the second way you can do it, maybe how much iron you are putting during your synthesis. And if you measure iron content in your wash solution, how much iron you left, then do you do a mass balance calculation, then to have a uh, close idea about how much iron loading you are in there. There's another question about the videos for animal study. Uh, go ahead, can I answer the question? Let me see. Animal studies, do you use these specific chemicals? Okay. okay. So, <clears throat> yeah, so for, you know, it depends. So there are work where people have done, looked into uh, 
cytotoxicity, cytotoxicity of nanomaterial. It's a very common practice of looking at the cytotoxicity. So if you're looking at animal cells or you're looking at plant cells, of course, two different areas. So, uh, you know, you're talking about, uh, so chemical, so let me see one more read, read or send. Specific uh, so, chemical for synthesis. Uh, it depends upon what nanomaterial you want to synthesize. You know, so iron nanomaterial is common. Iron is iron is delivered. They have used, you know, carbon, uh, you know, uh, for delivery. They have used uh, gold uh, material for that one. And uh, there are gold gold nanomaterial is very common for drug delivery and getting into delivery something some load to the cells. So that can be delivered in different ways, conventional synthetic way, and also the <clears throat> green way. Challenges with green way is that, you know, it is not standardized yet. You know, so that is where a lot of research opportunities are there. And it depend upon what kind of end use you're looking into, you may end up not standardizing it too much also. You may be, if you want to use it for agriculture, possibly in a, you know, natural nanomaterial. You know, you want to synthesize iron nanomaterial based on two plant-based products, iron from plants or iron from soil, and also polyphenols from plants. I think that will be such an ideal situation. I know people have done it. So in India itself, I know uh, NIT uh, Karnataka, one of my friends has done that process. He used plant-based polyphenol and soil rich in iron to synthesize iron nanomaterial. So you know, those can be done. And uh, I, I'm debating from your question, basic question. But what I want to emphasize is that there are there will be ways to synthesize material for specific for specific cells. You know, what works for also what we have done, we have done a lot of work with plants. Uh, the nanometer effect of nanomaterials are plant specific. What works for dicot is different than what works for monocot. You know, there are there are different species. Not only uh, impacts depends upon a lot of factors. You know, a lot of because plant considered is to be a foreign material many a time, so they react differently. So it's still depending upon what purpose you have, and there are a lot of work done on delivery of drugs to sales, specific sales, specific group of sales. And there are a lot of work that is the most developed area possibly one of the most developed areas you know delivery of drugs to sales and disease areas <clears throat> okay the question is how do you know iron is entrapped in the graphene oxide cis uh, just absorb on the surface of graphene oxide don't know go ahead <clears throat> Oh, so we to confirm that we did some TM microgap study that will give us a visual confirmation that is is on the it's not actually entrapped it is deposited on the surface of the graphene oxide so yeah man and sometimes it happens you have multiple layer of graphene oxide so like it can be a sandwich but it's not a entrapment Phenomena, it's a deposition phenomenon of nanomaterial on the surface. And TM is the best way to visualize it. Yeah. And, and, and you can look at it whether it's coming out from it or not, because we, you can do some of the desorption studies or you know the dissociation studies, so you can find out whether it's coming out from there or not. And possibly also depends upon the functional group, what functional group you have. You can predict from there whether it is. Uh, that that functional group is going to attach to the iron nanomaterial or whatever nanomaterial you are using. I think, and this is more or less. And you, you can also do. Can I, can I, have we done FTI or anything? We have not done FTI, right? No, we did XPS. XPS, okay, yeah, XPS. We have done XPS. I think I can put that thing here to show how it looks. Okay. So this is how it looks means this if you see this black dot this is the iron nano and this the other matrix this is graphene oxide so it is deposited in between layers on the surface of the graphene oxide it's a flat sheet 
and as we're talking about this code cell structure so this is the outside iron oxide and this inside core is the metallic iron and this confirmation we have from the xps that we have oxide and metallic iron both also if you look at the, also if you look at the bulk water the bulk water you will see iron not coming out from there so we analyze the bulk water also so you will see that not coming out i think that's how you confirm it So, am I audible? Yes. So, there are certain questions in the YouTube uh, uh, streaming also. So, can I uh, can I read out those? Questions? Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, sir. Uh, Shamali Patel has asked that uh, after she has watched the videos and came to know that uh, we can preserve nanoparticles by using ethanol. So, she wanted to know for how many days or months we can preserve nanoparticles using ethanol. No, I I don't think I don't as long as you I think yeah, as long I don't think there's a limit on time as such. So no, do is there a limit on time? I don't think so, right? No, there <laughs> will not be limit of time. Mm -hmm. But like if you want to use up a certain period, it's best way to make sure you can do another TDM or any analysis to see how your material looks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, yeah. but if you using within mm -hmm. a four, five months, six months, it's a safe to use. Yeah. But if you want two years or three years after that, is do another material characterization, make sure your material are intact. Yeah, I think I think we have used it for used it after, you know, uh, uh, you know, lot of lot of years. In fact, we looked into we looked into data like six seven months data, and things are pretty well preserved. You know, so so you should you should not have any problem. You don't have to use it in twenty four hours or something. You know, that's that's a good thing about it. Okay. Thank you, sir. There is another question. Uh, a participant has asked that, sir, can nanotoxin technology make energy cleaner and cheaper in future? So now, do you have any data? I, I do not know okay, what so we will do. I, I do, not, do not know offhand. I mean, okay, I know. So, that, yes. So energy cheaper and cleaner so as as we know that most of our energy sector is moving to solar renewable mm -hmm. now the major challenge of that in industry have how we can store it mm -hmm. means we can that is the battery technology mm -hmm. and that is the major work now working done using nanotechnology how we can make a better battery electro material or uh, so yeah so yeah, super capacity the super capacitor research use the energy so that will you have more efficient thing to store mm -hmm. that is the one of the sector you can have it more efficient and cheaper will be your solar, solar panel so there's a extensive research working to develop new material which are more efficient to capture so right now i think most of the solar panel efficiency is very less mm -hmm. we capture very less amount of energy during the process so this is the another area we can improve using our technology yeah solar typically solar panels are where it used to be about eight nine percent efficient efficiency has gone up now into 20s so that is that is a remarkable jump but still it is not well efficient also i think that is where i suppose the less expensive technology coming up you know in assam and everywhere people use solar panels actually you can sell electricity now so that's one of the ways to make your electricity less expensive I think there are a lot of opportunities for doing in a solar area and also in the regular fuel area. Uh, I don't know anything, any lot of work has been done, but additive can be one ways, but I do not know there have been a lot of work done, but I think Tonoy Tono pointed out solar is the one way where we are looking at a lot of improvement and a lot of cost reduction. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have another, I think this will be the last question from Aditya Kaur, he has asked, uh, sir, how and where nano waste are dumped? Say it again. How we dump the how nano waste. Oh, okay. How okay. And yeah. where? Yes, that is the, I think this is the possibly the most intriguing question. How to go about 
I'll give away. Okay, I'll give. I'll, I'll take you take you to Assam here. So there is a water treatment plant in Kothara, Nalbari area, where they remove arsenic using some nanotechnology device. Okay, so nanotechnology device they use it. So this is an ion exchange process, very efficient process. And you should, if you have not visited Kothara, you should visit it because I call it a tit. You know, TikTok. So kind of a you, you need to visit that place for water. You need to go this. So now visit that place. So Kotora, what they are using, they're using nanotechnology. But whenever they have some problem with the material, they carry it back to Calcutta to you know fix it. Now there are of course arsenic is also stored out there. They also store the used nanomaterial there itself. Right now. Disposal of nanomaterial is a big problem, you know. Uh, so, uh, of course, that is a problem we are going to have uh, in terms of, take for example, your TVs are using, you know, uh, nanomaterials for color development and everything, right? So, different color. If the new TVs are using nanomaterials to development of color, different colors, beautiful colors you get. So, disposal problem always remains. But what we do, uh, we do, Tonoi can talk more in details, we do certain tests, whether it can be disposed in a regular disposal area or it needs to be disposed in specific, you know, hazardous, hazardous waste disposal area. India doesn't have a lot of hazardous disposal, waste disposal area. Uh, we, in fact, do not have a regular disposal areas also, which you need to have. But we do certain tests, you know, uh, uh, so TCLP test or something. So Tana, you can talk a little bit more about it. I suppose you can add to that one. Yeah. So for nanomaterial disposal, so the major problem is means if you consider in United States in hair, so they consider it a toxic. Doesn't matter. So they con they do don't do TCLP or anything for nanomaterial. They talk consider toxic dump in a hazardous waste site. That's mm -hmm. they are doing right now. Because uh, the TCL, the TCLP state mainly done with if any toxic chemical coming out of or not. But for nanomaterials, the problem will be the material itself is a possess some threat. So yeah, there is no means in here it is a considered toxic, so you have to dispose in a hazardous waste site. But I, I think in India there is no regulation yet. Not only India, a lot of country doesn't have any strict regulation yet. But as this thing is increasing, I think there should be some regulation for disposal. So there's a question about blood substitute. I'm sending you a link on that one. You know, so I think I think it is a slightly older paper. So, but uh, there are there are work being done on blood substitute, definitely using nanotechnology. That's a possibility because you can, as I said, nanotechnology is something where you is a bottom-up approach. You know, so you can definitely do stuff. Uh, you can make stuff from uh, putting atom to atom together. There works being done. Yes, definitely. So there are, you know, uh, let me see. You know, there are artificial cells being made. You know, a lot of lot of things being done in that area. Absolutely, we do not work in that area, but there are enough work being done in that area. You can just again go to Google Scholar or just go even googling that same you know, word, you know, artificial RBC using nanotechnology, you will find, you know, a lot of papers out there. Okay. Um, thank you so much, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, this was really a mind-blowing session. So uh, uh, I would now like to request... Uh, uh, may I have uh, one question, please? Yeah. Go ahead. Sir, actually, uh, I did a postdoc uh, in the uh, University of Mississippi on uh, synthesis of gold nanoparticles. Okay, after coming back here, actually in college, I, I, I got very difficulty in synthesis of nanoparticle and uh, whatever you have shown in your lab, actually, it will not be available in our, uh, our college. So how will you uh, proceed uh, for that kind of uh, experiment? So I think I think important thing is here. That's what we talked about Tonoy and we talked that we can talk a lot of big things 
but instruments will not be available. Here also we have some issues sometimes. They take, for example, Donoy has to go to University of Central Florida do certain experiments because we don't have the facility here. You know, it happens. Now, how can you do it? You know, you can do wet chemistry based research, wet chemistry based research. Also, the, you know, not the dry nanomaterial, but liquid nanomaterial research very easily. You know, that, is, that will not be very difficult. You know, so if you want to produce dry nanomaterial, then only you have get into a lot of so instrumentation. But producing liquid nanomaterial will not be very difficult. Suspended nanomaterial in liquid, so it will not be difficult. We can talk more about this one with you. So it, it should not be very difficult to do that. You know, we will have challenges, but I think we can overcome that. I have seen, you know, we have ourselves produced nanomaterial without using a lot of instrumentation. You know, so only characterization, you need a lot of instrumentation, but basic synthesis part, and all we should not be needing a lot of lot of it. characterization only uh, is difficult yeah characterization what we can do what you can do i know i worked with your you know dr kakoti from institute in in assam more more, more yeah. so i work with him so he's a they also send out samples one of the ways to overcome this problem is to collaborate with somebody in one of the institutions where they can do the characterization for free. That's why I have been emphasizing on the collaboration part very much. You know, uh, so I, th I think you need to you need to, you need to collaborate with good, good, good group of people so that you can do the analysis. Somebody from IIT maybe, you know, so that can be a good source. I know Dr. Bora and others do a lot of work in IIT, you know, uh, so they can be good resource for us as well. Okay, sir. Yeah, so but, actually, but I'll I tell you on, on the positive side, positive side, I'll tell you this. Pardon? I applied, recently I applied for a collaborative project in IIT. If I get, I'll get the chance actually. Sure, uh, sure. Oh, no, you know, one of the things is, so, is, so one of the good things about India is this, if we want to do one TEM or, you know, electron microscopy work, we spend up to five hundred dollars, right? Don't know about five hundred dollars has come to the that big. Five hundred dollars means you know your you know forty thousand forty thousand rupees. But India, same thing can be done in possibly five thousand rupees. So that's the positive part. That's the positive part about it. You know. So only thing you need to find other resources, and you need to when you propose propose your budget, you need to make provisions for that. Yeah, there is one one question how anyone join uh, how can anyone join you know, technology research you start doing it that's it so you can you know you need to you can you can do you not necessarily have to do nanotechnology you can do whatever you do just do it right that's it you know okay i think yeah so we are almost two hours now yeah thank you yes, yes, yeah what is the next yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Achinda Bezbola and Dr. Tanay Kumar Das for being here with us and uh, motivating us and inspiring us. So, moving on to the next part, uh, we have amongst us, uh, we have amongst us the President of Zoological Society of Assam, uh, Mr. Priya Bhattal, of course, sir. So, uh, I would now like to request him to kindly say a few words. Thank you, Sandhanti. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Sinto and Dr. Sonoy. Full discussions here. Many scholars will be inspired. And one more very important part uh, Dr. Bezbola has said is that the collaborative effort. I think the, the principal of Prakriti College, Dr. Mahanto, who is a very dynamic person, he can lead uh, a team to do some work on this part in collaboration with North Dakota University. And he can talk with Vesborua so that a collaborative work can be made more work. And also, you have uh, mentioned about this plan. 
from from which the phenol uh, can be derived and nanotechnology can be used to do some over there. And in this case, our Jugan Kolita, this general secretary of JRC, uh, who is now head of the Department of Geology Guwahati University, can coordinate the whole. That's what I feel after listening to you. And I think you will extend your cooperation, extend your hand, and our persons of people will uh, cooperate with you. Thank you very much for enlightening us with this new area of research. Thank you, Anmay, and thank you, Bezbora. Mohan Mohanda, for bringing uh, us a very good uh, discussion today. Thank you all. Thank, thank you. you for your encouraging word and uh, one minute i would uh, like to take from all of you uh, i am very much indebted uh, by your uh, speech here both of you uh, professor Bez uh, bezbora sir and uh, dr tanay so uh, i will be very happy if you have some collaborative work with my institution i am ready from my, uh, give my support uh, to any level whatever needed and i will request uh, our research uh, scholars particularly uh, uh, I don't know. Technology department uh, to take the initiative in this regard, and I am ready to help them. And I request uh, Bezbora sir and Tonoy to help our staff in this regard. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Thank you for having us. Good night. Good night. Uh, thank yeah. you, sir. Uh, now we have among us a more dynamic person, uh, Dr. Jogen Chandra Kalita sir, who is also the head of the department, Department of Zoology, Kohati University and General Secretary of ZSA. I would now like to request uh, Dr. Kalita sir to kindly say a few words. Over Thank to you, you sir. So it's a beautiful time we had with Professor Asimjo Narayan Bezbulwa and Tanya. It was excellent. Right from the beginning when I talked with him, he was planning differently. And Professor Bezborua was telling me that it cannot be like the normal way what we do. It can be a different way so that our students. Today I am very happy to see that initially 100 students joined. I do not know whether they are all from Pragyoti College or from 600 colleges of Assam or maybe from outside of Assam also. But when the certificate link was given earlier, unlike what we normally do, 50% student left. So therefore it is a big problem in Assam to keep the motivation up. Even if we are, I am doing research for last 35 years, but always I find that research scholar, they have enough potential, but they do not want to develop. Same is the case with our college students. So why I'm telling all this, because Professor Bezburwa, when I contacted him last year, vigorously, very dynamically, we are working together, connecting college after college, one after another. My interest is undergraduate student now. So I want help from young faculty members. Please connect undergraduate student to highly reputed professor like Bezburwa and researcher like Tonoy so that we can motivate the students at the basic level where they can like ideas, new ideas. And ideas are very important. Ideas and the highly educated people are the most important resources for India. If I talk about... Ideas, yeah, we need educated people and their ideas to bring prosperity to Assam and more so that protein the social as well being. And to do that, the tree. before it was established. The principal is whenever I see, even yesterday he was talking on TV about the future and 
system, Houghton evaluation for our better future. So as he is the leader, I want help from Swetana, Sima and all, so that all departments can join hands together to encourage. Most important part is to encourage. And how to encourage is very difficult because they spent three years, you see, United States of America and United Kingdom, where I did my PhD, they do not bother about master. Years or four years, BSc degree is most important to develop the future career. So therefore, my main interest is undergraduate student. Therefore, instead of inviting Professor Bezbulato, I connected to Pragjutis College because I knew that Dr. Manus Kumar Mohanto is very dynamic. Whenever I see a professor, principal is very dynamic, I connect like CNB College, like Morigao College, like Kanoi College and many, many more, including Nogao College, autonomous. So with that spirit, we are working. And as I said, graduate quality is very important. So Professor Besburu and Tonoi, please help us as our president has said, how to develop graduate quality. When students are there with Dr. Mohanto, with the Sima Kaur and Sankranti Devi, so that they can develop themselves to the world class, like Tonoi. Tonoi, a product of PSU, Punjab, PAU, Punjab Agricultural University. And I can tell you, wherever you go in the world, in any university, at least you will be getting a person from Punjab Agricultural University. Okay? Yeah. I am, I am proud of you. And finally, I, I am very much interested in collaboration. But that collaboration not on paper. It should be, okay, dynamic collaboration. Paper and work. And, and last, I want to... Okay, lastly, it is disturbing because so many telephone calls are coming. Because so many people are phoning because exam will be there, they are making queries. Finally, I want, uh, I believe, individual action. Individual action matters. Student, friends, and research scholar, 49 now. I would like to request you, as Professor Besbuga said, if you are only three, but you are three, please put your hands on and write now. Think about and plan now and connect Professor Besburua, Tonoi, very young, here to support you. And you will practice this college, this tight bonding, so strong, and nobody house the archive of Dr. Mohanto. I have Mohanto. Please lead them, motivate your young faculty, because very often I find that Many of them are frustrated. young faculty Okay, Dr. Mohanto knows. Thank you so much. I'll try my best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for your inspiring words. So as we have come to the end of today's session, I would like to request Mr. Sarod Sarma, uh, a head of the Department uh, of Chemistry, Pragjutish College, to offer the vote of thanks on behalf of the whole organizing committee. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, we have come to the last part of the session. So, Honorable Chief Guest, Professor Jagin Chandra Kolita, sir, esteemed resource persons of today's workshop, esteemed colleagues, all participants, and my dear student friends. And I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose the vote of thanks in this auspicious occasion today. First of all, I would like to propose the hearty vote of thanks to our chief guest, 
professor jogen kolita sir for gracing this occasion and for giving us this opportunity to organize this international workshop so thank you sir for your very interesting and thought provoking address thank you sir thank our distinguished research persons dr asim to bejburwa and dr tonoy kumar dash for making the excellent presentation and making the workshop very interesting and meaningful i hope from there now i would like to act profound gratitude to our honorable principal dr manoj kumar mohanta sir for his presence in this workshop i am happy to express the vote of thanks to all my esteemed colleagues who have made the workshop a very grand success our the organizing committee of protection of bharatdas and dr jayanta kumar dekka for today for making today's event a great success finally i thank all the esteemed participants and my dear student friends for their active participation and cooperation once again i thank you all for your cordial cooperation thank you sankranti yes sir yes sir i could take one more Uh, I would like to thank you for the presentation. Sir, you are not a bit audible, sir. Actually, video to off the lock. Sir, you can turn off your video. Yes, sir. Yes. Are you audible now? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. to invite uh, professor bejbura sir to my college when you to come to guwahati you please visit our college sir and uh, dr tonoy you to please come to my college when you come to guwahati i will my pleasure to uh, invite you to my college please visit my college they will come they will come yeah sure <laughs> okay please thank you principal will declare the closing of the session principal dr mohanta will declare the closing of the session video to aapko log thank you everyone uh, for joining us uh, particularly professor bejbura sir tonoy all of you thank you very much for giving us this time and uh, wish you all the very best to my research scholars and my fellow teachers i uh, hope i will uh, they will be very much encouraged with this talk and uh, wish you all the best thank you thank you good night thank you good night <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Thank you, everyone. It's my doctor. It's excellent, excellent session. Really wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Nath. Thank you, Baidu. Sima Baidu. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, sir. 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 It is possible to collect the target today. We synthesize nanoscale green tea iron nanoparticles using green tea polyphenols as the reducing agent. Before you conduct your experiment, make sure you have your proper protective equipment, including a lab coat, goggles, gloves, long pants, and closed-toed shoes. Here are some of the supplies that you will need: a hot plate, specifically with stir control. A one milliliter micro pipette, a magnetic stirring bar, DI water, a 100 milliliter volumetric flask, a 250 milliliter flask, a 50 milliliter centrifuge tube, filter paper. A scale for measuring your materials and a centrifuge for filtering. Now for your chemicals, you will need iron chloride, sodium hydroxide, 
commercial green tea that you grind into a fine powder. For step one, you will begin by adding your weight tray to the scale and zeroing it. Once your scale is zeroed, begin adding your finely ground green tea to the tray until you have measured out a total of 10 grams. Once you have finished measuring your green tea, it should look something like this. You are then ready to add it to your 250 milliliter flask. Okay, I mean we are doing series of meetings and work. Yes, yes, Once yes. all the green tea is added, grab your we magnetic stirring bar and place it are. into the... Thank you very much. <laughs> no, Scott. Good night. Good night, Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. See you again. Good night. 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 Good Thank you. Okay, thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Bye. Good night, everyone. Good night. Welcome to you. Bye. Bye.